it's round five of Norway chess and I'm going to show you the classical game between Sergei Karyakin and Magnus Carlsen. This is really exciting. You're going to enjoy this. Stay tuned. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting us via PayPal or Patreon. Check out the rewards on Patreon. Here we go. Karyakin with the white pieces and he takes on Carlson's Sveshnikov. Now, this is really brave. I mean, frankly, when Karyakin played like this, repeating the exact line that he had uh, used against Carlson in Shamkir 2019, where Karyakin lost, a, well, an inc a fantastic game by Carlson. I thought this is either very brave or very foolish. Possibly both, I'm not sure. Anyway, this line has been played by Carlson in so many games, of course, starting with the World Championship match in 2018. And then in 2019, Carlson had enormous success with this variation. So Karyakin really needed to have his head switched on going into this. So big threats here, of course. So therefore, Bishop d7, Queen b4. And here is where... In this game from Shamkir, their previous game, Carlson played bishop f5 and he played this in several games with success. Let me just remind you very quickly of that game. Went like this bishop e2, and very soon Carlson seized the initiative with this really bold pawn sacrifice, just giving up the, that h pawn to bring this knight into the game and indeed that knight turned into a legendary mythical octopus knight on d3 and and carlson won a superb game if you haven't seen that please do check out my video you'll find it in the link up there press the i or in the link down there you'll sort it out i have confidence let's go back because instead of bishop f5 carlson protected the d pawn with queen b8 and this uh, he's also played before so h4 trying to push that knight away so h5 blocks but that pawn is now vulnerable a6 the knight is pushed back now here previously carson has played a5 against caruana in the world championship tiebreak he's also played f5 and that was against Jordan van Forest in the Tata Steel Tournament 2019. And he did well in both those games. On this occasion, he played bishop e7. So, new move. So, Carlsen knows his stuff. And indeed, he must have done his homework. Because this is the computer recommendation. Bishop e7. Of course, very sensible. Brings a piece into the game and comes out with tempo. Attacking the pawn. So, therefore, g3. And Castle's kingside from Carlson. So we have a really unbalanced position here. Um, I do like this pawn majority on the king side. This f pawn is ready to fly down the board under the right circumstances. Um, maybe that pawn can be pushed to give the knight a square. And black can also has the possibility to strike out on the queen side sometimes with b5 or maybe advance that a pawn as well just to uh, push that queen around. Well, what's what's white got going for him? Well, space advantage and potential sometimes to push with c5. Uh, but it's a very unusual position. Uh, I mean, this queen is oddly placed on b4, could be a, a tactical liability. Uh, this bishop is a nice piece that kind of anchors um, this pawn or is anchored by that pawn. So that's a nice pawn chain. But uh, it feels to me as though, you know, black has more dynamic possibilities here. And, well, we saw that. We see that with Carlson's next move, pawn to b5. So he is starting to blow up the position um, and counterattack on the queen side and this makes a lot of sense, considering that white's king is still in the middle of the board. 
Periarchin exchanges once, and well, if bishop takes b5, you can see that there's actually a pin here. And this is all about gaining time. Whoops, after bishop b5, f5, basically Carlson would launch on the king side. And, you know, white has to get out of this pin. Got to deal with f4, the king's still in the middle. Nah, too much play for black. So Karyakin decides to take that pawn, and it's so similar to this game from Shamkir that they played, where Karyakin also took this h-pawn. Um, so you, you can imagine the thoughts going through the players' minds at this moment. Carlson thinking, fantastic opportunity to repeat, um, you know, a win as before. And Karyakin must have been thinking, wow, okay, does lightning strike twice? Let's see. Carlson played bishop d8. Now, this is such a common maneuver in the Kalashnikov. I call it the bad bishop bounce. The bishop hits the back rank, but is going to bounce out to one of these squares, activating beautifully. And that bishop on e3 is, is really a key piece in white's position. You can see it just kind of glues everything together. So if black gets rid of that, and, well, yeah, definite improvement of black's position. Finally, on move 19, Karyakin castles. Knight e7. So this knight wasn't doing much. Now, it couldn't get in this way. I think that pawn would just could just be taken. But instead, Carlson finds another way to get that knight into the game via f5. Bishop g5. So that preempts knight f5. Bishop a5 pushes the queen back. And now knight f5. That might even gain another tempo. Um, to spin into d4 against the queen. So knight e2 covers the d4 square. And bishop b6, that bishop, finds this superb diagonal. Of course, uh, that is rather uncomfortable for white. And, and, you know, already, well, that e-pawn could just nudge down the board and start to really disrupt white's king position. Rook c1, and now... Carlson played rook a4, and, and yes, this idea really starts to come into play. Rook looks great on the fourth rank. You know, just hitting all these beautiful squares. And Karyakin said that he found it difficult to find a move here. Nevertheless, he did find a very challenging move. Rook c6, exchange sacrifice. And I, I really like this idea. Of course, it's a very common idea with a pawn on d5 supporting the rook. You see this fairly often in the King's Indian, actually. Um, so the idea is that, well, I mean, first of all, the rook is quite challenging here. And if that's taken, then the pawn takes its place. And this diagonal is opened, and there's a nice pawn on c6. And, and in fact, Carlson didn't need to take that rook. He could have just played bishop c5 instead, just cementing things for the moment. But that's not his way. He's he likes to get on with business. He likes to you know make these kind of positive decisions quickly. Grab the rook, and now rook c4, which looks very powerful. Just keeping that pawn under control, the rook shuts out white's pieces. Excellent move and. But here is where Karyakin came up with a superb idea. It's a pretty random position, but this move randomizes even more. I mean, very clever. It undermines the position of the rook. If rook takes pawn, I mean, that's the dangerous pawn one would like to eliminate. Then queen f3 hits rook, hits knight. Queen c8 covers both pieces. Bishop g4, very annoying pin. g6 takes, of course, queen takes here, allows queen takes rook. Pawn takes, but this gives white superb compensation for the exchange. King looks very exposed. That knight kind of glues everything together and could maybe come into d5. 
very good compensation. So not so easy for black. Rook takes probably the best move. Now you can't play queen takes pawn because of bishop takes pawn. Um, Got to watch out for that one. Um, but I mean, white has several options here. Um, bishop f3 is pretty simple. Just bring the rook back. Uh, excuse me, the bishop back into play, guarding the pawn and maybe bishop d5. And well, white has compensation. It's a very unclear position. But I do like the way that this just you know nudges the rook to the side slightly worse square um, and, and just complicates in fact Carlson played knight d4 knight takes bishop takes and a takes b5 now it is possible to take that pawn but bishop e7 isn't so clear of course if the rook moves then the, the queen steams in you can see it was worth um, this, this exchange sacrifice. But white should be better here. After this, and king g2, nice and safe. Put the king on a, on a light square. You know, this bishop will come around here. And this pawn is very strong on b5. Okay, let's come back d5 just played and here Kuryakin comes up with an excellent move rook c1 that rook really does control so many squares and you know st stops the the pawn ever advancing so uh, good to exchange this one off and queen b6 so at first sight okay Carlson the exchange up with black has a good blockade on b6 supporting the bishop yeah those pawns are far advanced it seems as though Carson has everything under control here bishop e3 well I think this is a very brave move actually because after this exchange well you know that that bishop can be a good blockader it also could be a nice attacking piece but this does open up white's king um, so a double-edged decision. Let's see how it works out. Rook d8. Defending the pawn, preparing to push. King g2 takes the king off this diagonal. G6 pushes the bishop back. Bishop e2. King g7. These, these very tidy king moves, I like them. Queen c3, so this obviously provokes a little bit of a crisis here. So d4, takes, takes, and solid blockade of the d-pawn, very sensible. And basically Karyakin is in control here. These pawns obviously protected, black can't do anything about those. And here, it makes complete sense to switch to the other side of the board. I think h5 would have been a very nice move to just chip away at black's king, just opening up black's king position. And I think by playing on two fronts, that would make life extremely difficult for Carlsen. But instead, queen c2 played by Kayakin. And here, queen b4 was, was played. But rook e8 looks like an excellent move. And rook e3, and this gives black pretty good counterplay. But instead, queen b4, b3, and now rook e8. Bishop c4. So this is Karyakin's idea. You know, he's got this beautiful chain where the pawn protects the bishop, which protects the pawn, which protects the other pawn. So that's very typical of his play. Um, you know, he's looking to, to get absolute security before moving forward, before, you know, going for something like h5. Um, rookie three, once again, probably the best chance for black. 
but rook e7 played by Carlson does protect f7 and covers c7. Queen f2 attacks here, which was defended. Queen f3. Now the end game is winning for white. Obviously, these these pawns are too much. So queen b4, king h3. I'm sure Karyakin enjoyed playing that move. The king very secure here. These squares covered very nicely by the queen. Queen d6. And now queen f4. And here Carlsen miscalculated. He should avoid the exchange of queens. And, well, white is better, but there's still some way to go. Instead, Carlsen thought that he was just simplifying down into a drawn endgame. And here's why. d3. Threatening to go all the way, so that has to be taken. He wins the bishop. And now it's the turn of the pawns. But Carlsen had only looked at c7. Let's have a look what happens. c7. Rook takes b3, queen, rook takes, and this position Carlsen judged to be a fortress. And that does appear to be the case because the rook can stay on h5. If the queen attacks there, it can switch to f5. Um, and there are king moves as well. And I think that's probably true. Of course, white has lots of tricks. Sometimes Zugzwang, but I think that should be a draw. But instead of c7, Karyakin played b6. This is really clever. Rook takes b3, b7. Now, clearly one of these pawns is going through. White can just push through like this. In the meantime, you know, black can do nothing. So rook b6. So what is the difference here? Well, here is the difference. First of all, before getting that new queen, h5. And this disturbs the king position. So pawn takes, king comes up. I mean, this is kind of a finesse. Um, basically, white is just going to play c7, c8. Carlson preempts that, takes, and b8. But this, by contrast, is a winning position for white. And here, Carlson resigned. Okay, why did he resign? What's the difference between this position and the last one? Well, here the rook does not have stability on the fourth rank. So if you look at these squares, well, f5 can't be protected. d5, c5, b5. The rook doesn't find protection. And these squares are covered. Okay, so how exactly is white going to break this? Well, basically, if the pawn gets to f5, and it's possible to put that there very easily, and then the king can take, and then we're going to force the king back. So let's have a quick look. King g6. Okay, tactically this works. If rook takes, then queen b1. Zugzwang, pin and win. I thought you'd like that. <laughs> king takes f5, and queen f2 check wins the rook. So basically the king has to come back, but you know f5 can be forced anyway. Queen b7 check. King here, queen back, so just protecting that pawn. Okay, the rook at least finds security on e5, but check. King goes back and king takes h5, and this is very easily winning. The queen's going to give a check. When the king comes here, well, that, that f pawn can be won very easily, um, but also the, the king is coming in as well. I mean, this is just a very simple win. Wow. Um, at the end of it, in the interview afterwards, uh, Karyakin said, I can smile again. He lost very badly against Nepo the day before. And yeah, this, this was um, a good way to, to strike back. I have to say, what... A brave decision to go in for this incredibly complicated line. Particularly, you know, when Carlson obviously knows it incredibly well, has a superb record. 
But Karyakin said, if you want to fight, you have to go in for some crazy lines. And, well, he certainly did that. A really brave decision, but it paid off. Fair, absolutely fair play to him. And, yep, critical moments. Carson made mistakes. And Karyakin came through with flying colours. So that helps Karyakin's position in the tournament. But um, the, the leader at the moment is Richard Rapport. Still doing very well. And Nepo is in second place. And Carlson is really struggling at the halfway point in the tournament. Can he catch up in the second half? Let's see. Uh, don't forget, like, comment, share and subscribe. And do consider supporting us as well via Patreon or PayPal. Thanks for watching.